Okay, hi there. It's Jeff here again with another in our series of industry profiles. The aim of this is basically is uh, to try and give you a little sense of uh, some key data, some key issues, some points of analysis and evaluation across a range of industries. One area that the examiners are really keen to stress ahead of your papers is for you to showcase your knowledge of the subject and add, when you can, some contextual application to your answers. So if, you, if it's okay with you, let's spend some time, a little bit of time thinking about uh, airlines and airports, and in particular, some of the challenges they faced as a result of the, the pandemic. Indeed, the UK and European airline and airport service industry, making a distinction here between the airlines themselves and uh, the service infrastructure, including airports, has been hit really hard by the pandemic. We've seen a terrific fall in passenger numbers, uh, big fall in revenues, and in many cases, of course, airlines have moved from profit to loss. Some airlines have shut down. Others have curtailed their routes or found ways of cutting their costs. And government support has been really crucial in the industry, particularly a furlough scheme during the early stages of the pandemic. That said, as the airlines emerge from the pandemic, as demand picks up again, we're seeing severe labour shortages, which could be a feature of an exam question. Just a, a bit of context here, this chart shows commercial airlines' net profit uh, from 2013. And uh, you know, over the period from 2015 to 2019, and indeed 2020, before the pandemic, net profits were pretty strong in the order of somewhere between 7 and 9 billion US dollars. But look at the consequences. In 2020, post-COVID, the losses expanded to $34.5 billion and $11 billion in 2021. So, you know, those cumulative losses far outweigh the profits basically made in the previous decade. Uh, Heathrow Airport is another good example. So airlines making losses. Heathrow Airport, of course, has been hit badly. This chart shows the revenue flowing into the airport in millions of pounds. So uh, from about 2.2 uh, billion in 2012 to just over 3 billion revenue in 2019. But look, then look what happened in 2020. Revenues collapsed. They fell by upwards of two thirds. So the airlines have taken a hit and so too have the airports. Heathrow is interesting. So Heathrow gets its revenue from a variety of ways. Let's just spend a minute on this. Obviously get their revenues from things like landing fees and selling landing slots and departure gate slots at the airport. Come back to that in a second. But uh, retail is a massive generator of revenue for the airlines, uh, for the airport, sorry. Uh, retail concessions brought in nearly £7 million a week in 2019. That collapsed uh, to £97 million in 2020. Fewer people travelling, so car parking fees fell. Heathrow in 2019 was making three, just under £3 million a week from car parks. And catering and other services are obviously badly hit as well. So it's a good example here of how a fall in passenger numbers and fewer flights, uh, basically the shutdown lockdown of the industry has badly affected Heathrow's ability to make money. Just a quick note on ownership. Uh, Heathrow is now is owned by Heathrow Airport Holdings. And I just broke down for you, just to give you a feeling for, for this, who actually owns Heathrow. 25% is owned by the Spanish construction giant Ferrovial. 20% by Qatar Holding Company. There's 12% for a, a Quebec Investment Corporation. Singapore has 11% ownership. Linda Capital 11. China has 10% ownership of Heathrow. And the 10% is owned by the University Superannuation Scheme. Uh, interesting, from a globalisation perspective. Uh, and I mentioned landing fees. The Civil Aviation, uh, Aviation Authority has now given Heathrow the green light, if you like, to increase landing fees uh, to £30 per passenger from, from the existing level of £22. So clearly Heathrow, Heathrow needs to pick up the revenue after the pandemic. But it's interesting that they now can charge £30 per passenger for everybody landing at Heathrow. An interesting charge. So these are the biggest airlines in Europe in 2021, just based on passenger traffic. I could have shown revenue. Uh, you get a slightly different picture if you look at revenues, because obviously it depends on the type of services on offer and the average revenue per passenger in terms of ticket prices. But in the end, I chose passenger traffic in millions. The reason being that Ryanair is streets ahead. It's the biggest European airline by some distance, followed by Lufthansa, Aeroflot, Turkish, uh, Turkish Airlines, Air France, KLM, and IOG, of course, which is part of British Airways. 
And then you get some of the low-cost airlines as well, EasyJet, Wizz Air. We'll talk about Wizz Air in a second. So there's some big airlines there handling, you know, 20, 21 million passengers a week. Now, uh, one of the big issues, I think, in terms of airlines and aviation is the extent to which uh, the market for passenger flights is contestable. So one aspect that you might get tested on or quizzed on is the, in terms of applying the idea of entry barriers to a new carrier coming into the aviation market. It's a good, it's a good question because there are many different types of entry barriers that could be considered. So, for example, the cost and availability of landing slots. The cost of leasing airport departure gates, that's quite a big revenue raiser for airlines, uh, for airports. Sorry. Brand loyalty, of course, for existing carriers. Because obviously if brand loyalty is strong, it's going to cost you more in terms of marketing. Uh, first mover advantage for established airlines. First mover advantage, we have a video on this on the YouTube channel. It's basically the advantage of being first into a market. And it's not always a big, big advantage, but once you're established, it does give you some advantages, including economies of scale. The capital requirements to buy or lease aircraft, the cost of hiring skilled staff, and crucially, of course, you need to uh, cover the costs of meeting all the safety standards and things uh, to be awarded a flight license. And linked to all of the above is just the risk of entering a market, and in particular, the extent to which there are sunk costs if things go badly wrong. So aviation, good example, I think, of barriers to entry. Uh, one, one example of a business that I think is worth following is Wizz Air. Now, Wizz Air is an ultra-low-cost carrier on ULCC. And it's actually, I think, one of the biggest airlines now in Central and Eastern Europe. It's founded just under 20 years ago, and it's headquartered in Budapest in Hungary. So it's a really interesting example of a Central Eastern European low-cost airline that's actually gained a lot of ground recently. Flies to over 150 airports in 50 countries, uh, mainly Europe, Central Eastern Europe, but also Africa, the Middle East and Asia. Look at the growth of Wizz Air. It was really picking up very strongly in terms of booked passengers from 10 million in 2011 to over 40 million in 2020. But again, the impact of the pandemic in particular is lockdown kicked in and affected Central European airlines. Um, the load factor for Wizz Air is a key factor. So load factor is the percentage of seats that are actually booked and taken up by passengers. And you can see that uh, they were making good progress. They'd risen from 84 to 94%. So they were very successfully essentially filling their flights. Keep in mind, a lot of the, the costs of a flight are fixed. So the more passengers you have on the flight, or the, the higher the percentage of seats filled, then the lower is the fixed cost per passenger. And, and for low-cost carriers, that is absolutely essential to maximise revenue, increase the load factor, and make profits. But of course, Wizz Air was hit in 2021 by that, by the uh, the pandemic. So COVID-19 presented uh, easily the biggest the biggest challenge in history for the aviation sector. So British Airways, low-cost carriers have faced big challenges. Many have suffered a big fall in revenue and demand, and losses. Some operators have announced big job cuts. Others have cut routes, loss-making routes, for example. Others just maintain the routes but offer fewer flights per week, so less choice for customers. And some have collapsed. Norwegian Air UK, for example, liquidated, liquidated in January 2021. Here's a little list, uh, in addition to Norwegian, of some of the recent UK airline failures. Uh, Stobart Air collapsed in the summer of 2021. Flybe uh, collapsed a year before. I think it's just restarted, actually, on selected routes. Thomas Cook Airlines went bust, Wow Air, Fly BMI, although notice there that uh, four of them collapsed just before the pandemic really hit home. Well, uh, the drop in airline and airport activity, which we've seen in the charts, essentially a very deep recession in airlines and aviation has impacted on many other businesses and sectors throughout the supply chain. So sometimes you get a question, what's the multiplier effect? Or examine the impact of a fallen Passenger, passenger numbers on businesses other than the airlines. So this allows you to talk about the supply chain in the industry. So consider the consequences for travel agents, for example, for tour operators, for taxi companies taking people to and from the airports, and crucially, the industries that are the direct service uh, systems, the fuel wholesaling, the aircraft maintenance, the engine and parts, uh, the aircraft builders, for example. So the multiplier effects can be quite strong in a negative way when the industry suffers a big recession. 
Okay, so lots of ways in which airlines and airports might, repeat, might figure in exam questions. Let's just quickly look at a few of them. Uh, the impact of the pandemic on demand, revenues and profits. Yes. Evaluating ways in which airlines can control their costs. That's quite interesting. The extent to which the airline industry is contestable. So we've, we've mentioned that, thinking about some of the barriers to entry. Uh, very important one, because externalities appear on the advance notice. Airlines, airports and their environmental impact. Also, I mentioned that in a second. Policies linked to that to get the aviation sector to decarbonise, including carbon taxes and carbon trading. The different pricing strategies that airlines um, adopt and also the fact that airlines have different business objectives. To what extent are there economies and diseconomies of scale in aviation? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of airline mergers, for example, or, or external growth? Different types of price and non-price competition. And perhaps, given that many of these um, many of these kind of sub-markets are essentially oligopolies, the extent to which there might be collusive behaviour between firms. Uh, I can't quite get the market share data for the UK that I really wanted to. So I had to travel over the seas, the transatlantic, to look at the US, just to give you a feel for, for uh, an oligopoly. I think this is a good example of an oligopoly. If you take the five uh, leading airlines in the United States by domestic market share only last year, it comes to 71%. That's the same if you have Alaska Airlines or JetBlue. So oftentimes uh, you either have local regional monopolies or duopolies or oligopolies. This is clearly... Uh, where the big players have a strong handle on the market, but there's aspects of contestability as well. And I mentioned seat occupancy rates, uh, load factors, it does vary quite a bit. Thomson Airways Limited uh, in 2020, had a high, uh, two airlines are now, had a high load factor, Jet 2, Norwegian Air. So not, it doesn't always guarantee his success, but in 2020, of course, a lot of these load factors fell because airlines were only able to take a certain number of passengers per flight. Yes, externalities, pollution, emissions, very, very important. Globally, aviation accounts for around 8% of CO2 emissions in the transportation sector. Uh, passenger cars far and away the biggest and trucks, shipping 11%. But aviation is not, it's not insignificant. And therefore, of course, there's a lot of pressure on airlines and airports to, to become low carbon innovators. These are the airlines in the European Union, uh, which had the highest CO2 emissions in 2019. Lufthansa and British Airways came top. In terms of labor markets, lots you could do, supply and, de supply and demand for different jobs. Um, the impact of the minimum wage, for example, on airlines and airports could be usefully discussed. I just want to show you what's happened to one or two things. One is pilots. So in 2020, of course, this was the year when the aviation sector largely closed down. If you look at the employment profile of pilots worldwide, uh, just under one in five were furloughed and 30% were unemployed. You might want to think about in revision the types of unemployment that might be suffered if aviation goes into a long-term decline and moves from a sort of cyclical decline into something a bit more structural and permanent. Another big aspect is female employment. Uh, globally, only a tiny minority of pilots, fully qualified pilots, are female. So it's quite an interesting case study in terms of gender inequality and gender opportunity. Uh, these are the airlines in the world with the highest share of female pilots in 2021. Air India came top, but only 12%. Irish airline Aer Lingus came second with 9.9%. And a hat tip to Hawaiian Airlines with 9.3%. OK, so exam gold. Uh, this is an industry, a sector where um, it's fertile ground for exams. So I'm going to ask you this question. <laughs> you might want to practice these. And who knows, I might actually do a separate video on these diagrams in a little while. Can you draw the following 10 analysis diagrams? Cost and revenue diagram analysing the impact of the pandemic on profits. Interesting. Cost and revenue diagram showing the effect of rising fuel costs on airline profits. Yeah, good one. Can you draw the shutdown price for a loss-making airline in the short run? Can you draw the externalities diagram showing market failure from CO2 emissions? Yeah, that's a good one. 
Uh, can he show a diagram showing how the emergence of new entrants might affect pricing behaviour of existing airlines, including the limit price diagram? Can he draw price discrimination analysis diagrams? Any comments of scale? What about a supply and, diagram, uh, supply and demand diagram for a government subsidy for an airline to keep it going? Or a supply and demand diagram for a pollution tax on airlines? And also labour markets. Uh, can you draw the monopsony diagram if airlines have significant monopsony power? Uh, can you show a diagram showing what happens when labour supply and demand for skilled pilots changes over time? This, the more I think about it, this industry is superb for testing your understanding of economic knowledge, analysis, great for application and also evaluation. So there we go. Uh, a little bit longer than usual, but hopefully a useful extra case study on airlines and airports. As always, thanks for joining in. Stay healthy, stay happy, stay positive, and hopefully see you again sometime soon.